Hey, everybody. Uh, good morning, and welcome back. And thank you very much to everybody for coming in to listen to me talk today. Today, I'm going to tell you about one of, one of Intercom's engineering strategies called Run Less Software. And before I do, I'm going to do a whirlwind tour about what Intercom is for anybody who doesn't know it. So Intercom is an Irish startup. We, our mission is to make business personal. We provide a software as a service solution that helps every single part of a company talk to its customers. And we believe if a company is able to have real, meaningful conversations with its customers, good things absolutely will come from that. So this is Intercom's engineering strategy, or one element of it. Uh, it's also a little bit more than that. For me, it is kind of like a, a slightly dark, unsettling view of how, of how I see the technology world evolving. But I think there's also hope to it as well. When I was actually talking to my coach about this, he said, why do you think it's dark, Rich? And I said, I see it as a battle. I see it as a war, and it's almost like a war of attrition. And I'm actually going to tell you about the war. The first army in the war is us, Intercom. We are this like small, little, naive, hopeful, fast-growing startup trying to actually win in, in its own battle for market dominance. But we aren't alone in this war. We have copycat. We have a load of different competitors who are absolutely trying to beat us at our own game. They, they are trying to take our business idea and execute it better than us. And it has never been easier for anybody else to actually do this and beat us at our own game. Why? Money is cheap. Interest rates are at an all-time low. Interest rates are at an all-time low. Investors are incentivized to invest in anything which actually is a better chance of return than 0.5% they're actually going to get in a bank. So money is easy to get. Basic execution is also becoming easy too. You've got AWS, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, soon to be serverless functions as a service, you name it. Uh, you've got Angular, Ruby on Rails, Iconic, whatever your favorite software development framework is. All of these things mean that a competitor is able to do in like days or weeks with simply only junior engineers, an email address, and a credit card, what, what it actually took once, months or years to actually catch up on. So first mover advantage is absolutely gone. It's useless. The, set, the, the next group of people in this battle are all of us. We are the soldiers. We are the people who all of these companies are are buying for. And so far, that's actually working out OK for us. Why? Because demand outstrips supply three to one. So far, there are more jobs than there are software developers, or operations professionals, or security people, or systems engineers, or whatever. But there are a couple of fantastic companies who are watching this war for talent. And they are trying to do something about it. They are continuously moving the abstraction line higher and higher and, and higher. And what that means to us, if we're not careful, if we're not actually moving up that abstraction layer, over time, our jobs get commoditized, or at worst, they get deprecated. And that's a pretty scary thing. And God help you if one of these people take aim at you and try and actually compete in your own business because they have more money than you, more engineers than you, more experience than, than, than you, stronger brand than you, and everything. You could be in really, really, really deep trouble. And my coach, who I was explaining this to, he's saying, Rich, you are one of the most paranoid people I've ever come across. Uh, and I said, am I really that paranoid? Let's actually talk through a couple of real examples of, of how this is actually playing out. Let's talk about Slack versus HipChat. And he was like, what the hell is Slack? What the hell is HipChat? And I said, HipChat were actually one of the best companies coming along inventing modern business messaging. And they own the market. And then Slack came along. 
and they're kicking ass thereafter, dominating the market and overtaking HipChat. And I said, maybe you've heard of Snapchat. Snapchat are this like, wonderful company reinventing social networking. And they started to do it a little bit too well. And Instagram actually took note. Dead stock walking. Who wants that? Not me. And I said, let's, let's actually talk about another one. Let's talk about the most scariest, saddest one of all. Anybody here heard of Blue Apron? Yeah? So this is like using Jedi force. Amazon announced, I don't think they even announced, I think they said, I think they actually registered a trademark similar to Blue Apron and the stock tanked. Then they actually went into the business and they started kicking ass. And one month after IPO, 24% of staff were cut. There's lawsuits about it now. 1,270 people lost their jobs. So who thinks I'm paranoid or who thinks I'm realistic? Money is cheap. Basic execution is easy. Talent is scarce. Threat from one of the four. It's real. I lose sleep over this stuff. Hopefully, some of you might. I said this is a little bit of a dark tale. So how do you win? What's, what's the strategy? And what the hell has it got to do with run less software? Uh, this thing better start. Come on, you can do it. Maybe it can start. OK. So in the movie The Matrix, Neo is able to beat his stronger, smarter foe. And the way he does it is he slows down time. He's able to see and understand and react to the world faster than his competitor and thus defeat him. Now, this isn't the Matrix. Well, hopefully it's not the Matrix. Uh, I am a Neo. I don't have superpowers. But I think his general strategy of managing time is actually pretty good. So in engineering, I think the way we win is we do everything in our power to help us see, understand, decide, and react more quickly and effectively than our competitors. And what this actually looks like to me is, uh, t is time well spent is when our scarce top talent is focused and productive, solving only our most important and differentiating challenges. And that's basically what run less software is about. It's about making the best use of our time and doing the things that really matter. And for us, it's broken into three things. We save time by choosing standard technologies. We save time by outsourcing undifferentiated heavy lifting. And we spend our time really, really wisely creating enduring competitive advantage. So let's talk about choosing standard technology. And I've been having a little bit of fun with like battlefields and wars. So let's take that one forward one more step. So let's say I'm a medieval soldier, and there's a couple of different weapons I could choose. There's absolutely no way I'm going to go into battle with all five of these on my hip. And depending on the size or ferocity of the person running towards me, I'm going to go, hmm, I think I'm going to use a long sword for this one. And then for the next person, I go, oh, I'm going to use a saber for that one. In reality, what would actually happen is your army general would say, I have, a, I have a short army of elves, and therefore we are, actually gonna, we are actually all going to use short swords. And all of us are going to practice together, and all of us are going to get really, really good at these things, so that when we go into battle, we are going to win. And for me, that's what choosing standard technology is like for us. It is constraining ourselves to mostly, but not exclusively, using a small, opinionated set of company-specific technologies that, over time, we become expert in. And this actually really stands to us in the long run. I've crossed out Choose Boring Technology here. Who here has heard of Etsy's Choose Boring Technology? Choose Standard Technology sounds an awful lot like it. It is very much inspired by it. Dan McKinley wrote this awesome blog post from Etsy uh, he has a fantastic video to go with it. I encourage everybody uh, to read it, watch it, learn it. It should be required reading for software engineers these days, as far as I'm concerned. In it, he has this lovely formula where he says the 
total cost of any engineering decision equals, to, equals the sum of all of the operational costs which arise from that engineering decision minus the velocity benefits you actually get from your engineering decision. And by choosing standard technologies, by limiting ourselves to a small set of technologies that over time we become really good at, we enable low cost engineering decisions that are easy and cheap to maintain and live with, but fast and powerful to use. So here's this super messy, dense slide, I apologize. Uh, what it actually is, is it is six years worth of hard fought, lessons learned, mistakes, uh, successful launches, outages, post-mortem meetings to help us have an opinion on what are the 10 most standard technologies at Intercom. What are actually the building blocks we are gonna try and build everything out of? And I said this is like an opinionated company specific set. Some other company could very, very, very reasonably say for them standard technology is Go and Python running on, running on Google Cloud Engine using Spanner, Bigtail, uh, Big Table, Prometheus, and Kafka. And that could be a perfectly good strategy for their company. But the important thing is when they come to Intercom, they, they actually get to learn that we are, we have actually made a deliberate decision not to use those, and we actually want to stick with it. Mostly, but not exclusively. The astute amongst you may have noticed that six of our six of our 10 standard technologies are outsourced. Mostly to AWS, but not exclusively. Honeycomb in there is like a really small, early stage startup, and, they're and they are fantastic, and we love them. Which brings us nicely on to outsource undifferentiated heavy lifting, the second element of our strategy. There is surely nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency what should never have been done at all. So this is a saying by Peter Drucker, who was one of the most prolific management consultants of our time. He was born in the 30s. I think he said this in the 50s. It, is, it, it was relevant then. It's relevant now. In 2006, the prophet Jeff Bezos said, there are lots of undifferentiated heavy lifting that stands between you and business success. And he thought about 70% of a company's energy was spent on that undifferentiated heavy lifting, and only 30% was, was spent on your own company's success. And he thought he looked forward, he thought people would actually look forward to a world where they actually got to flip those two things. So we're nearly there. We're, we are nearly there. We're at 40, 60. I would love to get to 30, 70. I think there's a way we could do it, but I need somebody who is but I need somebody who is going to be able to manage a world-class Elasticsearch service for me, for, for us to be able to get there. Amazon can't do it yet. So that's it, outsource everything, right? Uh, turns out, no, we have this little philosophy. This is, un unfortunately, up until now, this was mostly in our heads, and it was only actually writing this talk forced me to clarify it. We have four tiers of people that we consider outsourcing to. Number one is AWS. Number two is best-in-class public companies. Number three is mid-stage startups. And number four is young startups. And we are especially wary of young startups because they go out of business. Over time, all of their products generally get more expensive. Their security posture is worse than yours, probably, unless you are also a young stage startup. And that introduces risk and cost. Other things we care about, customer data, privacy, GDP, uh, GDPR, PII, all these things. We want all of our customer data to live as much as possible inside of our AWS VPC. And if it goes outside, we actually have to take on a lot more work and risk scrubbing the data, anonymizing it, figuring out, figuring out how to delete it, um, understanding other companies' data retention strategies and stuff like that. So anything that has customer data associated with it, we try and keep it inside of our VPC. Which brings me to the last bit of run less software, create enduring, creating enduring competitive advantage. Tyler Durgan from Fight Club once said, the things you own end up owning you. 
So Kieran Lee, Intercom CTO, way less famous, says the, says the exact same thing way more often to me, and I listen. So what do we own? What do we end up owning, and is it actually a true reflection of our mission? So we own a bunch of Ruby and JavaScript. Primarily, we use the, we use the Ruby to help us knit all of those undifferentiated heavy lifting parts together. We use JavaScript to help us build our UI. We have to run our own bare metal Elasticsearch because nobody else can do it well. We write our own uh, real-time messaging protocol and we also create our own messenger. Now as a customer communications company who vends messaging software, I think those are an okay set of things for us to own and I am okay with them owning us. So that's all the theory, right? Let's actually see it in action. Let's go to war and see if we win the battles. So here's the first one, nice and easy. About three, four years ago, we were running a smattering of MySQL and uh, Postgres databases, two swords. And we said, let's actually consolidate, let's go all in on AWS, RDS, MySQL. And how, how did this actually work out for us? It worked out fantastic. Why? Because AWS Aurora, the greatest thing since sliced bread, came along and gave us a 5x, gave us a 5x throughput improvement for free. And better than free, it was 30% cheaper than AWS RDS or uh, MySQL to begin with. So this one worked out really great for us. The second one also worked out pretty great. So Intercom is a customer communications company. We store billions of users in a schemaless fashion that update very, very frequently. So databases, billions of schemaless rows, updating very frequently is a nightmare, it's really hard. We used to do it in MongoDB, served us well for about five years, uh, but over time it became uh, un unreliable, hard to scale, and was extremely expensive. It was like one third of all of our infrastructure costs were spent only on MongoDB, and then you threw in support contracts and everything else on top of it, it was tough. So we decided we had to rebuild this, we had to scale it, and we decided we were gonna follow the philosophy of run less software. And so we tried putting it all on Aurora, so it uh, worked a little bit, not great. Then we tried putting it all in DynamoDB, mostly worked not quite great. But this brings you to like this other element of choosing standard technology and run less software, and it is your problem solving skills. It is your ability to take this like really big, hairy problem that, that looks like it has never been solved before and can't be solved with standard technology and break it down into different bits and pieces, which slowly but surely look like things that actually can be solved with standard technology. And that's, and that's basically what we did here. And we were able to write a little bit of Ruby to help us knit both data stores together. And now we have a solution which we are in the middle of rolling out, which is 90% cheaper dollar cost than the previous solution, natively scalable, uses standard technology, and is just way, way, way cheaper human-wise to run. We are able to free up three engineers to help us work creating more enduring competitive advantage. The last example is a tale of woe. Uh, this is one we lost. So Intercom's Messenger, or Intercom's Inbox, nice bit of JavaScript on the web. It's the thing that our customers use to see their conversations with their customers. Intercom is multi-platform, so we have it implemented on web, iOS, and Android. Three different implementations, three different code bases, three different sets of engineers, three different sets of bugs. This starts to sound a lot like run more software. Uh, and we had this great idea. Web technologies have advanced so much. Maybe we could do it all on web. Maybe we could use iframes and we could try it out. And so we went to our mobile engineers and we said, hey guys, hey folks, hey people, we, we would like you to try this. And they got really upset. We didn't explain what we wanted to do properly or why. We didn't explain how we still loved our mobile engineers and how we really appreciated them. We didn't, we didn't properly set out how we saw the problem, how we saw success. We failed to properly empathize with how, how they might feel about it. 
And I guess to them, we maybe looked like Amazon, who were like moving up that abstraction layer. And the net result was what I think was like a reasonably good technology strategy ended up stalling and, alienate, and alienating our, or annoying a bunch of our engineers. And we've had to work really, really, really hard with them in order to help rebuild that, that trust. And that, you know, I've used a lot of really dark, uh, masculine war like uh, imagery today in this talk, and I kind of did that on purpose uh, because, as as the last example shows, strategy is actually easy, but people are the really really hard thing, and anything which is any technology problem which is really hard requires a diverse set of problem solvers. It requires a great set of people who are able to bring different perspectives together to, to help you solve your problem. And that's the thing you really need to work at. One of the ways we do it is we look for problem solvers rather than technologists. We, most of us went to college and did some form of a technical uh, course, and we think we're software professionals or ops professionals or something like that. But really, we are problem solvers. And technology is a means to an end. And as we've seen, that technology abstraction layer is moving up and up and up, and we need to have that mindset and work with it. Now, don't get me wrong, I love technology. Uh, I'm a builder, I love it, I'm always gonna be that way, but I just think we all need to be alive to this. Okay, so we're getting very near the end. Uh, what's the prize? What do you win? What, what is actually a really successful outcome from this? Well. Uh, as I said, this is intercom strategy, but it's also a very, very personal, intense, deep belief of how I see the world. So I'm actually gonna mix and match a little bit with this. I've also not been able to get through this bit without choking up, so if I do, bear with me. Uh, so the first thing I'm playing for is, I want to, and intercom is playing for is, we actually wanna to continue to be one of the fastest growing companies of our generation. One of the other things, I'm also personally playing for is I want to continue to, to be part of and build inclusive, fun, diverse sets of teams that are able to build really, meaning, really meaningful software which solve problems for people and, and help them win their own battles. And the last thing I'm playing for is just having fun and have, having a nice life. That's it. <laughs>